to HDK this morning as we uh, see something of that very strange creature called the sun peeping through. May the Son of God, Jesus Christ, peep through into your life today and bless you as we worship. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Gracious Lord, we come before you to thank you for this wonderful day, this Sunday where we remember your resurrection. We ask you, Lord, to bring new life to us all. Let us be healed of the burdens and the trials of this week. Uh, let us put aside all that weighs us down and find your healing and indeed be refreshed for the new week that lies ahead. So bless us, O God, in the fullness of your name, the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's stand for our uh, opening bracket of songs, and uh, if you feel like sitting at any stage, please feel free. Lift up your voices and lift up your praise. Join with the heavens declaring the wonders of his faithfulness forever Sing out the victory 
join us. Hello. We're all going to stand up again in a minute, but first of all, I just want to read you something really quickly from the Old Testament, and it says, Ezra opened the book, just like I've opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, the people stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. Then they bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Now, you know what? A little bit earlier on it says, he read it aloud from daybreak till noon. That's like six hours. That's a whole morning. Could I stand here and read to you from the Bible for the whole morning? Could anybody concentrate for the whole morning if I just stood here and read? But they did because they were so excited about it. Now, you know what? I'm going to do something with you guys now. Steve's going to bring that chair over for me. And we're all going to actually, we're going to come over here. Sorry, Nigel. We're all going to come over here. And I'm going to put the Bible on the chair. And we're all going to stand in a circle around it. Can you come and stand in a circle so that this is in the middle? That's right. So all come around here. Um, let's see who else. Janet, you can come down too. Come on down, make the circle. All right, so we're all in a circle. Can you see it? Can you see the Bible? Can you see it there? And you know why we can all see it? Because it's in the centre. It's in the very middle. Now, if I take that Bible and I'm going to put it back here, without moving, who can still see it? Okay, so not everybody can see it anymore. Because it's not in the middle anymore. It's off to the side. I'm just going to put it back in the middle. Now, that was a bit of a weird thing to do, wasn't it, to put that in the middle? But you know what? When we put, what is the Bible anyway? Is it just a book? Is it just a book? What is it? What's in it? Any God's talking, yep. Yeah. Stories about God, what else? Other people, sing it out. The word of God, what else is it? Gospels. The law, that's right. That's where we come to learn about God. And when we read the Bible, we're worshipping God at the same time. We're learning, we're understanding. It's an amazing thing. And you know what? We need to have that Bible in the middle of our lives. We need to be able to see God in our lives all the time. And our church here, we have that Bible right in the middle. 
that's what is right at the very centre. Does that make sense? Right. Bit of a weird thing to do, but at least we can see it. Can you see it right there in the middle? No. You can't. <laughs> wow, there it is. So let's just pray about this. God, we just thank you that you give us an understanding of you through your word, through the Bible. And we thank you, Lord, that we put it at the centre of our lives and we have it at the centre of our church and we use it for learning, for understanding, for making decisions, for worship, for prayer, for all those wonderful things. Oh, God, we thank you. Amen. Thanks, guys. So the Lord be with you. We are the body of Christ. And the peace of the Lord be always with you. Let's share the peace in the COVID-friendly way. One day we will be over it, I hope. We're already over it, but we can stop doing it this way. Yeah. Okay. I don't know why that's up there. That's a bit early because we've got to hear from Gary and the scriptures, first of all. You may be seated. The reading this morning is from Acts 11, verses 1 to 18. It can be found on page 1089 of the uh, Pew Bibles, if you'd like to listen in. The apostles and the brothers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, you went, in, you went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. Peter began and explained everything to them precisely as it had happened. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. I saw something like a large sheep being let down from heaven by its four corners and came down to where I was. I looked into it and saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, reptiles and birds of the air. Then I heard a verse, a voice telling me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. I replied, surely not, Lord. Nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. The voice spoke from heaven a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and then it was all pulled up to heaven again. Right then, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying. The Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. These six brothers also went with me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen an angel appear in his house and say, Send a Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He will bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said. John baptised with water, but you will be baptised with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift as he gave us, who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could oppose God? When they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, So then, God has granted even the Gentiles repentance unto life. Hear the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This morning I'd like to share with you from the book of Nehemiah, chapter 8, verses 1 to 4a, 5 and 6, and 8 to 10. And if you've got a pew Bible, that's page 479. When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people assembled as one man in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra the scribe to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women, and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood on a high wooden platform built for the occasion. 
Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, the people all stood up. And Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted up their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. And then they bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. They read from the book of the law, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people could understand what was being read. And then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, This day is sacred to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. And Nehemiah said, Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks, and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is sacred to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, as you spoke to spoke your word through your servant Ezra, and it moved the hearts and hands of your people Israel. So speak today to us by your word and move our hearts and hands in service of you. In your precious name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Today we come to the final sermon in my annual series of HDK as an evangelical, sacramental and charismatic church. I preached this series in the reverse this time. We started off with HDK as a charismatic church and I preached to you from the gospel reading of the baptism of our Lord Sunday from earlier in the year. Last week I shared with you a HDK being a sacramental church and I used a, a free text centred around the blood. And today, this message I share with you comes from the Old Testament reading for the third Sunday after the Epiphany. Uh, this is because I'd planned to share with you this series of sermons earlier in the year, but the COVID Omicron outbreak put paid to that. Now, in this passage from Nehemiah, we discover the book of the law of Moses, the word of the Lord to the Old Testament people of God, Israel. And it's being read and explained. It's a, a preaching experience. Our text even tells us Ezra the scribe stood on a high wooden platform built for the occasion. It sounds a lot like a pulpit to me. So as we consider the theme HDK as an evangelical church, we'll particularly focus on the contribution of preaching to the life of the church in actually being an evangelical church. The great evangelical Anglican preacher John Stott once said, nothing is more important for the life and health of the church than biblical preaching. Churches live, grow, and flourish by the word of, the, of God. But the truth of the matter is that preaching has fallen on hard times. Webster's Dictionary describes preaching as to discourse on moral or religious topics, especially in a tiresome manner. The Chambers Dictionary gives this definition to give advice in an offensive, tedious, or obtrusive way. These are not uncommon perceptions of preaching, particularly in the world. Why has preaching fallen on such hard times? Well, one of the main objections is that in our democratic society, where everybody feels that they have the freedom to express their own opinion, it sticks in people's crawls to have one person out the front standing up and telling them what they should think. Who does he think he is? He can't tell me what I should be doing. Everyone should be free to believe what they want to believe. The unique task of preaching is not found in the egotistical person that he or she stands up the front and feels that they have a right to jam their opinions down the throat of someone else. The task of 
preaching, the task of the preacher is in humility to unfold God's authoritative word. It is God who has the authority, not the preacher. Another objection that is quite common today is this. <clears throat> People will say that modern communication theory points out that there are lots of different ways of learning and that the lecture is probably one of the worst ways of learning. We learn by listening, we learn by discussing, we learn by discovering and experimenting, to which every preacher would reply, reply true and amen. That is why in the church, we don't ask people just to come only and listen to preaching. We give opportunities for people not only to listen, which is one way of learning, but the other ways of learning, such as reading and discussing and sharing that we do in Bible studies and Lent series studies and in home groups. The uniqueness of preaching is found in the fact that what we have here is God's inspired word. That when someone stands up to preach and teach, they're actually claiming that they are God's called servant in that situation, whether they're ordained or lay, and that they have the approval of the church to do so. That as the people gather to hear God's word, they're doing so in the belief that God's spirit is in their midst, and they're coming with their hearts prepared and open to hear what God has to say to them. If that's the case, what we have here then is a unique communication experience, a unique learning, listening experience. Preaching in that sense is unlike any other communication experience. Paul writes in Romans 10, 13 to 17, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one whom they've not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they've not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all the Israelites accepted the good news for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. In this account from the book of Nehemiah, we have a unique listening experience. We find the people of Israel back home in Judah and Jerusalem after their 70 years in exile in Babylon. They had all settled in their homes again, and they were gathered together that day as one man in the square before the water gate. Now, this water gate has nothing to do with Richard Nixon. It's not sure where this scene actually unfolds. The unrestored temple courts wouldn't have been large enough for such a great gathering of people, but it was probably in a city street or by one of the large city gates that this gathering occurred. And those people gathered together there in unity and they told Ezra the scribe to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. The people had desired to hear the word of the Lord. It was in their hearts. Now, I know that there are various levels of ability to be able to write and deliver a sermon. But for preaching not to be boring and irrelevant, the listener has to have an openness and a willingness to hear from God in the midst of the sermon, despite the preacher's weaknesses. In my first parish, I used to have a man in the Lutheran church, people always stood up when the pastor read the sermon text, and then they would sit down. This guy, the minute I read the text, he would just always sit down and pick up his bull bulletin and read it from front to back, totally disengaged, and then he'd look around for other things to read. As a graduate pastor, I never said anything to him, but I longed to muster up the courage to say to him, at least listen 
to some of the sermon and find out that I am actually boring before sitting down and picking up the bulletin and assuming that I am. These people weren't bored, though, in Jesus' day, in, in Ezra's day, sorry. Ezra read the book of the law aloud from daybreak till noon. For six hours, the people listened to the law being read, not preached, but read. And those who heard it were men and women and others old enough to understand. In other words, older children. Now, you might be thinking, wow, listening to the Bible read to you for six hours, I could never do that. Well, I don't think there's any of us that could do it either. We need to remember at that time that Judah is a very old society with literacy. According to modern day experts, only being at 3%, and that was limited to the elite. Most people didn't have access to the word of God. And that is why the scroll or the book was brought before the people. With the written law, everyone could hear the teachings of God, God's word to them. Nehemiah writes that all the people listened attentively to the word of the law. And why was this? Well, they wanted to hear what God had to say to them because, quite frankly, things were in a mess. The Israelites had brought God's judgment upon themselves because they followed uh, their kings into apostasy and worshipped other gods. They did evil in the sight of the Lord. And as a result, the Babylonians came and destroyed the state of Judah, the city of Jerusalem, and particularly their temple. Now, after 70 years in exile, captured by the Babylonians, they were allowed to return home. But when they got back, the place that they had called home was in ruins. Their homes that they used to live in had been destroyed. The temple where God once lived with them and they worshipped him was in tatters. And it was hot, hard, difficult work to rebuild. And building supplies at times were hard to get. Some things just could not be restored to their former glory. So for encouragement, they went searching for a word from the Lord. You never know. It might just be at this time in the church's history for preaching to find its place again, not only in the church, but in society with the ravages caused by COVID with the rising uh, uh, prices of fuel and food and veggies, with interest rates rising, with climate change and all of this unseasonal flooding, with the threat of a third world war arising from the Russian-Ukrainian conflict and the uncertainty surrounding China and the Pacific. People might just be looking for what God has to say about all of this. What is his word to the world in this declining situation? Often on the front of the Bible, we see the words Holy Bible printed. And indeed, God's word is a holy word. It is the word of the holy God to the world. It's a place where people hear from God, and as such, it is to be revered. We read of a beautiful scene of reverence towards God and his word in verses 5 and 6 of our text. Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, the people all stood up. And Ezra praised the Lord, the great God. And all the people lift their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. Then they bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. In Article 20 of the 39 Articles of Religion, of the Ang of, which is a statement of faith of the Anglican Church, the Bible is called God's Word Written. And we do well to remember that and to live from that with regard to our attitude towards Scripture. God speaks to us in his Word and we respond. 
to hear the word and hear it read and to hear it proclaimed is an act of worship. As we hear the word read and as we hear it preached, no matter how feeble the preaching may be, it is an act of worship. And we, pay, we honour God by paying attention to what he has to say to us in the inspired word and in what he has to say to us by the spirit that is mediated to us in the preached word. When we pay attention to the word and we respond in thanks and praise, we are giving God worship, a word that means worthship, giving God his worth. While we do not idolise a book, it may be worth us as Christians raising the bar in the way we honour the Bible as the word of God. That we need to hear more of the word than just once a week or whenever we come to worship. That we are not illiterate Jews from 300 BC. And so we take the opportunity to read God's word that is freely available to us through the week and praise him for what he has to say to us. It may also be helpful for us to evaluate the way that we treat the actual Bible. I once heard in a History of Religions lecture that Muslims would be horrified at the way Christians treat their physical Bibles, especially leaving them on the floor. No Muslim would ever put the Quran on the floor. This would be an ultimate insult. We don't have to go as far as torturing people for desecrating our holy book as the Muslims do, but maybe we could grow in reverence for it by treating it better and with more respect when we handle it. Now, worship is an act of the heart. When we hear the word read and proclaimed, it's going to impact our hearts. Nehemiah 8, 8 tells us that they read from the book of the law, making it clear and giving the meaning so that people could understand what was being read. And as a result, all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. The people's hearts were impacted. They showed that their hearts were tender. They were touched deeply to the point of weeping. The law had probably cut them to the heart because they realized that it was their sin, their disobedience that brought about the destruction of Judah, Jerusalem and the temple and brought about the Babylonian exile. But then in verses 9 and 10, we read, Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest and teacher of the law, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. And Nehemiah said, Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks, and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. You know, there was a proper time to grieve the devastation of Jerusalem, but there also comes a time to move forward and rejoice. And while repentance and sorrow were needed, the Israelites could not camp there because they were now back home in their homeland with the blessing of their captors, the Persians. They had their homes after rebuilding them. The temple was slowly being repaired. God had saved them from exile. It was time to rejoice. It was time to enjoy choice food and sweet drinks. And as an agrarian people, this was good news. It meant eating meat and the fat of the meat and enjoying sweet wine, not just water. It was a sacred, special time of festal celebration. Nehemiah says, do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength. You know, joy can be an ambiguous term. People link it with happiness and the betterment of circumstances, health, success, fame, wealth, pleasure, fun, good fortune. In that sense of the word, joy is derivative attached to and dependent upon some external source. 
But that is not the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord cannot be manipulated, bought, earned, or deserved. The joy of the Lord is totally gratuitous. It is a divine gift to receive rather than a selfish goal to pursue. In this current world where there is so much that is tenuous, in the words of the English mystic Juliana of Norwich, the greatest honour we can give Almighty God is to live gladly because of the knowledge of his love. No matter how bleak the tragic course of human history, no matter how difficult our personal circumstances or how pessimistic the forecasts of our cultural prophets, with joy we can expect God's love to blossom even in the midst of the dust and dirt of our lives in this world. And so let us value the word of the Lord for the depths of its riches. And as it is read and proclaimed, let us give full sway to it, it's working in us from head to heart to hands. And let us indeed be HDK, an evangelical church. Amen. So, Lord, we thank you for the gift of your word. May it indeed move from our head to our hearts to our hands so that we may live your word and be your people and live in your particular joy in the face of this world that is so shaky. Strengthen and bless us by the power of your word to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand and join with me now in an affirmation of faith. There's a time for everything. A time to be born, a time to plant, a time to kill, a time to tear down, a time to cry, a time to grieve, a time to scatter stones, a time to embrace, a time to search. A time to keep, a time to tear, a time to be quiet, a time to love, a time for war. God has made everything beautiful. God has planted eternity in the human heart. People should eat and drink and enjoy the fruits of their labor. Whatever God does is no. God's purpose in this is. Amen. Okay, let's bow our heads in prayer. Gracious Lord, we come before you to give you thanks and praise for the riches of your word to us. May your word, your authority, your kingship impact this world that so desperately needs it. Lord, please bring your peace as the Prince of Peace to bear in our world. Particularly, we pray for the conflict between Russia and the Ukraine. We ask you, Lord, to bring your peace to bear. We pray, Lord, that the guns will stop firing, the tanks will stop moving, and people will stop being slaughtered. Oh, Lord, for the Ukrainian people who are suffering so much, we pray your supernatural peace. And we pray, O oh God, that you would bless them and their leaders as they 
Press forward, O God. We ask you, O God, also to please bless our nation as we approach the elections next weekend. We ask you, Lord, to bless our leaders, particularly Mr Morrison and Mr Albanese and all the other party leaders and politicians as they seek election or re-election. We pray, Lord, that your will be done. And indeed, God, from the book of Daniel, we know that you are the one who puts kings on their thrones and takes them off. And that, Lord, you will indeed, through our democratic system, bring uh, your government to bear for our nation. And we pray, Lord, that our government, whichever party it may be, will seek your will and ways for the blessing and the benefit and the upbuilding of the citizens of this nation. Lord, we come before you to pray for our community of the Sunshine Coast. We pray, Lord, particularly for the churches on the Sunshine Coast, that together you would bless our witness to this community, that, Lord, your light would shine in the darkness where people are pursuing false happiness and false joy, that by the light shone from the church they would discover the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is their strength. And so, Lord, we pray your blessing upon the ministry and mission of all the churches in our Sunshine Coast region. And Father, we pray for all of those who are ill or have been through surgery uh, from our congregation here at HTK. We thank you, Lord, for the way that things have gone so well for Jill Wood and also, Lord, for Lorna Lilly. We thank you for seeing them safely through their surgery. And we ask you, Lord, to bless them in their convalescence. We pray also, Lord, for Anne Robbins as she continues to go undergo rehabilitation on her new knee. We pray, Lord, that you would bless her as she continues to do the exercises. Lord, bless all of those who are struggling with health issues and the issues of just growing old, give them your peace, your blessing, your grace. So, Lord, now in a time of silence, we give to you those things that are on our hearts that each one of us needs to talk to you about. To all of these things we pray in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. I invite you to stand as we farewell our online viewers with the grace. So the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. You may remain standing as we sing our next song, The Power of Your Love. Be changed. 